Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I hope you have had a wonderful week. If you celebrate Christmas, I hope it was wonderful and relaxing and uh, joyous and whatever else happy emotions you want to associate with it. If you don't celebrate, well, I still hope that your Tuesday was wonderful and relaxing in some way. Um... I hope you're having a good week and, you know, this this last week of 2018, I hope it's going well. I do have another interview to share with you today. This time, as I said at the end of the last episode, I am speaking with author David Sklar about his new book, Atlas of Men. This is a novel, but it is based on some real events. It is fascinating, disturbing. It kind of runs you through a whole range of emotions. I mean, it, it really is interesting. It made me angry and sad because uh, these were based on real events. It made me um, fascinated to watch the main character kind of go through this journey of finding out answers to questions and exploring things in relationships that he hadn't explored in a while. And there's just a lot of different layers. And um, let me let me stop talking, actually, and give you the description of the book. And that is this. Files from a secret research project show up on Dr. Robert Thames's doorstep, forcing him to think about something he's been avoiding. The degrading study at Danvers Academy, especially the naked photos of each student, including himself, taken at his prep school. He tracks down four close friends from school, and together they uncover the terrible truth of what was buried by the faculty, the school, and the boys themselves. Secrets. And a lot of things going on here, you know, a lot of, a lot of things. There's lots, like I said, there's a lot of layers. There's a lot of things with, you know, consent, or in this case, the lack thereof. Um, the students didn't know why they were being subjected to this. You just imagine you show up at a private school and you are told to take off all your clothes and they're going to photograph you, but you're not told why, you're not asked permission, your parents aren't told, etc. So that's just one element of this, but it does kind of lead into so many other things that happen. And I don't want to give things away because like I said, there's so much that happens in here and there's so many different levels and layers and you really need to read it yourself to find out exactly why this was happening, why these papers suddenly just show up on Robert's doorstep, um, what he finds out, what all of these questions and opening up uh, conversations with students that he had been um, with at the academy, etc. There's all kinds of things that come out of this. So again, the book is Atlas of Men, and I'm going to now let uh, Dr. David Sklar talk about it because obviously he can tell you so much more about it than I can. Oh, I will mention one thing before we get to the interview, and that is that during his introduction and a little later in the interview as well, there is a very a very barky dog that comes in. Not very uh, not very long. Uh, maybe it's a little distracting, but I think it's endearing, frankly. The authors, when I talk to them, are usually at home, and you know, home often comes with barking dogs or other interruptions. So it's not long, and it doesn't really distract that much from the interview. But just thought I would warn you that there is a very loud dog in case you're like, "Wait, whoa, what? What was that?" Let's go ahead and turn our attention to my interview with Dr. David Sklar about his book Atlas of Men. Hi, David. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you, Sarah. It's wonderful to have you here on the podcast. We are here to talk about your book, Atlas of Men. Before we get to the book, though, I would love for my listeners to get to know you a little bit. So if you could just share whatever you're comfortable sharing about yourself, that would be great. Sure. 
Well, um, my real my real identity or my real job is that I'm a physician. <clears throat> I'm an emergency physician, and that was my training. And uh, I worked uh, in an academic medical center for most of my life, uh, training emergency medicine residents, uh, also medical students, and uh, practicing physicians. And um, most recently, uh, I have been the uh, editor-in-chief of a journal that uh, is mostly focused on how we uh, help teachers and students to uh, learn about medicine and become the best doctors that they can be. So that journal uh, talks about professionalism and communications and uh, going from being a novice to an expert, uh, which is what most uh, students are, are doing in, in medical school, learning all the, the various uh, procedures. My main function is to uh, try to educate people as to how to be the best teacher that they can be and uh, to uh, for students to become the best doctors that they can be. The other thing about me that maybe is a little bit unusual is that I uh, had a uh, fellowship uh, that I did in Washington, D.C. on in health policy. And uh, the health policy um, area that I worked on was the Affordable Care Act uh, and also areas around uh, physician payments. So with all the changes uh, politically around the Affordable Care Act, uh, with uh, the current administration, I think uh, mm -hmm. that has, has sort of become a an area, I guess, that I've I've certainly become interested in watching uh, how that efforts the, the efforts that we put in in terms of the healthcare system uh, have uh, sort of been altered uh, through the political process. Uh, and you know, when those things happen, it affects the way that uh, the way that we educate our doctors. Anyway, so those those are some other things that I do. I write on a regular basis. I uh, write editorials for the journal, um, and uh, those editorials usually are related to some of the key areas uh, around education. Um, and those are um, nonfiction, so they um, they generally are about uh, main topics uh, that we're interested in medical education research. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. So let's move on to the book. It is called Atlas of Men. And can you tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, so Atlas of Men is uh, a book that explores uh, the uh, the events around uh, the arrival of a uh, group of boxes uh, on the doorstep of our main character, whose name is Robert Thames. Robert is a physician. He uh, is an infectious disease doctor who goes around the world trying to um, identify uh, new uh, antibiotics potentially through um, looking at indigenous plants and uh, native uh, uh, medications and uh, traditional kinds of methods that are being used and and tries to uh, bring those back to the U.S. and, and then have them uh, uh, have research done on them to, to identify whether or not they actually may potentially uh, turn into a, a medication. Anyway, he, uh, he is uh, surprised one day to uh, receive uh, these boxes that uh, end up having uh, files in them, and the files in include pictures that were taken about of him and and his uh, other uh, classmates when they were students at a private school, a high school, many many years before. And he had almost forgotten about those uh, photographs, but those photographs were taken after he arrived. They were photographs that were taken um, when uh, the students. Uh, had to um, take off all of their clothes, and, and they never really knew what, what the purpose of the photos were. But in any case, these photos and files that were accumulated over many years end up on his doorstep, and, and he gets a letter that goes along with uh, the files that explains that, that these files were part of a research study and that the doctor at the school where he 
um, where he went, uh, had been collecting this information, uh, participating in the research, and now was was no longer able to uh, continue that research because he was uh, going into a assisted living and, and couldn't um, couldn't keep the uh, the materials any further. So he sends them to Robert because Robert is the son of a colleague of his uh, that he had gone to college with and, and also at uh, the same private school uh, with the hope that Robert would continue uh, and publish this, uh, what he felt was kind of important research. And, and he explains the purpose of the research was to try to uh, identify characteristics that could be measured from the uh, photographs about uh, the individuals. Uh, things about their body, their body type, and so on, that um, the main researcher uh, who was doing the work and who had asked this particular doctor to participate had a theory that uh, you could predict uh, leadership and future uh, future uh, occupation and things like that based upon measurements that uh, he identified, measurements um, of body types such as, um, and and the theory is called somatotyping, so it was measurements of um, what they call ectomorphy, mesomorphy, and endomorphy, and, and, and what that means is ectomorphy uh, was sort of the thin, narrow kind of person, and uh, mesomorphy was the more muscular person, and um, endomorphy was sort of the Santa Claus, you know, round, jovial, looking kind of person. And, and his theory was that uh, this uh, kind of measurement would, would have uh, value in kind of moving people in the right direction for their future, that, that you could uh, use these measurements uh, so that uh, people would uh, end up uh, being categorized uh, perhaps in a way that would uh, uh, help them uh, end up in the right career and become the person that they were supposed to be. So he gets he gets this uh, he gets these boxes of files and um, then has to uh, decide what to do with this, whether uh, to actually go along with the research and uh, continue it or or what he wants to do with it. And he. Um, as he as he thinks about it, he realizes that uh, he never was even told about the research, had had no idea that it was going on, and and has sort of a kind of two two reactions. One is that he's very angry that that it was done, and and that um, in fact that he was classified, and that he looks at his own file and and finds certain predictions that um, were uh, upsetting to him. And um, but then he's also curious about what what does this really mean, and and might there actually be some validity here, and uh, is it really worth pursuing? So so he uh, then makes contact with several of his friends. It turns out he has a group of other uh, friends who went to the school who were all uh, kind of outcasts in a sense. They they never uh, the people who were his friends didn't really feel like they fit in, and they all kind of got together playing cards. They played bridge together, and that was sort of uh, their social group. And, and he gets together with them over the telephone, and and in the process of talking with them, finds out one of them is actually very very ill, uh, and uh, that one um, asks him to come and uh, and and talk with him, meet with him, and has he says he has some really important things. To discuss, and and so as part of this whole process of looking at these files and this research project, there's this additional issue about um, illness and potentially the uh, death of of this friend of his. There's also some other issues that are going on with this friend of his. That, uh, as it turns out, there was a love triangle. His friend and himself and, and a woman that they both uh, met in high school were in love with, and so that and that was a love triangle that had never been resolved. So there's a sort of this little subtext of uh, maybe coming to some resolution about that many many years later. In any case, the the book then just follows this journey of our main character Robert Thames as he tries to unravel. Uh, uh, this this project 
and and what it was all about and um and get back together with with his friends and and try to make sense out of it and, and in the process of that they find that there's several other kind of concerning secrets that had been hidden and and so uh they have to then decide what they want to do about that so that's that's sort of a very very you know brief kind of thumbnail about about uh what Atlas of men uh tries to deal with it you know it's about identity you know who are we and are we sort of fated to be a certain kind of person based upon uh our body or our genetics or things like that or do we have choices that we can make that can move us in many different directions that have very little to do with uh those kinds of uh genetic predictors so there's there's pieces like that and issues related to uh messages we get as we're growing up um about race and ethnicity and even things like you know how how we look are we handsome ugly fat thin things like that and and how do those how do those uh, affect how we think about ourselves and maybe how we limit ourselves in terms of the uh chances we take and the opportunities that we avail ourselves of so let me go ahead and jump in here. That gives you a really good idea of what's going on in this book. But we do have to take our first break of the podcast. Before we jump to that break, I want to talk to you once again about Audible. And I've been talking about audiobooks forever on the podcast. I've been talking to you about how much I love audiobooks, how much I love Audible. And just want to remind you that maybe you have a New Year's resolution coming up and you want to read more or you want to listen to something new and so you're exploring options well audible can help you with that if you go to audible.com slash gsmc book review or text gsmc book review to 500 500 you can start your 30-day free trial which will include a free audiobook you can explore so many different genres from memoir to novel to mystery to self-help nonfiction all kind whatever you're interested in you're going to find something on audible they have a huge selection in addition to that title you get every month with your one audible credit you also get to choose two audible originals and they have some really interesting selections that you're not going to find anywhere else so that is three titles each month when you sign up again just go to audible.com slash gsmc book review or text gsmc book review to 500 500 to start your free trial today We are going to take our break, and so stay tuned. When we come back, we'll be talking more with author David Sklar about his book, Atlas of Men. You are listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we'll be right back. What happens to your decision-making when you drink? Well, after one drink, you feel confident. A few more, and calling your ex at 1 a.m. seems like a great idea. And you're pretty sure the secret to a great taco is four-day-old macaroni. The bottom line, drunk you doesn't make great decisions. So you're risking a DUI or worse if you count on him to get you home. Plan before you party. Get home safe. Brought to you by Washington Target Zero. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I'm speaking today with author David Sklar about his book, Atlas of Men. Let's go ahead and get right back into that interview. There really are a lot of layers going on within this book and within this story. Now, it is a novel, but it's based on real events. So can you talk a little bit, please, about how you decided what to leave in that was that was the real events what you fictionalized what went into that process well so um the actual events of uh, the photographs that were taken uh, those did happen i mean and i i did go to a school uh philip sexer academy where all of us were photographed uh and that occurred somewhere in the first few weeks of arriving and we were photographed without our clothes on, 
very embarrassing, kind of humiliating experience, and, and there was no um, information given to us about why this was done, and our parents never found out about it. And so that piece um, was true. Now, the actual characters um, were uh, are, are fictional, although I'm sure all of them have bits and pieces of people that I've known, but I, I created the characters who are, who are in the book. And I, and I did it actually because I wanted to have characters who, who would see this experience and even these uh, the socialization that occurred uh, through uh, the prism of, of kind of different, being kind of different people, different upbringings and different, uh, different sort of life courses that they were, they, they were on. And, um, uh, and I thought that that would be actually a, an interesting way to to explore some of these themes, uh, to try to see it through the eyes of people who were uh, coming from again different backgrounds and had different goals in their lives, and and how uh, being part of this research study and and being uh, potentially uh, pushed in one direction or another based on some of the data that was uh, accumulated on them how how that might play out uh, so so yeah so there there was definitely uh, some actual events that uh, sort of inspired you know the writing of this book and um, you know also unfortunately uh, the, at the school that I attended there were uh, there, there were other things that happened um, sexual predators who were there uh, on the faculty and you know another subtext in this in this uh, novel is um, that some of the sexual predators potentially could have access to the photographs and to the research and how would they how you know how would that affect them and um, and the relationship between them and students I think that's obviously a fairly timely issue right now because I, I think we're recognizing as people go back into their own histories that um, sexual humiliation, sexual exploitation, unfortunately, is far more common than I think any of us ever imagined it would be. And, and I think most people probably kept these kinds of events secret. They didn't want to talk about them because they're embarrassing or, or they kind of felt like maybe they had contributed to them in some way and so we didn't talk about them but now you know people are talking about them and i think uh so you know this book does have some um uh, some actual events that sort of inspired it yeah it's both fascinating and very disturbing can you talk a little bit more about the main character robert what is it about robert that you think will resonate with the readers well so robert is uh, he, he's sort of a cautious guy. He so he he grows up um, in the Philippines, and his his parents one uh, is a Philippine Filipino woman, and the other is a U.S. Um, soldier who's there visiting the Philippines. And but but he's actually brought up by missionaries because uh, his dad dies and his mother also dies, and so. He is brought up by missionaries, and and it's really the missionary dad who had gone to the same school who uh, kind of moves him in the direction of of what his future life will be by deciding that um, this will be a good educational experience for him. So Robert is one of these people that um, he's uh, doesn't really feel like he fits anywhere because his uh, Racially and culturally, he comes from one background. He's kind of then thrown into this other culture at at this private school, and uh, and he looks different, and he talks differently, and his uh, you know all of his um, cultural backgrounds or or background is is very different from that of the other students. So he's he's always a little bit afraid that he's not going to be successful because he's he's so different and he doesn't really know how to how to behave the way that uh will uh, give him the chance to to be successful and he, and so he uh you know he's trying to um read the signals around him and 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 kind of like i obviously he's sort of a chameleon he's trying to trying to uh 
fit into his environment without uh, giving too much away about who he thinks he is or who uh, he feels he is uh, deep down inside. And so, uh, and and so the pictures, um, I, I think, in some ways, are a metaphor for uh, you know this this same uh, you know this the same idea of uh, what is you know what is the uh, proper uh, way to look or um, you know is there a, an ideal body type uh, or an ideal characteristic that um, that that you need to have to potentially be uh, successful in the world uh, and uh, at at the time that he goes off to this school uh, his um, I think his friends and and the environment around him would suggest that uh, being white and being from an upper class and uh, having the proper wearing the right clothes and speaking with you know the right accent and so on is is what you need to do to be successful. So he's he's kind of a cautious guy and he's trying to trying to figure out how to how to do that how he can be successful uh, even though he knows that he doesn't really uh, have those characteristics that uh, that he sees around him. Uh, and um and and that's that becomes sort of part of his um uh, struggle in life and something that he ends up i think having to overcome as he evolves in the in the book uh letting go of this idea that he he does have to be something different from who he feels he is uh to be successful and ultimately making decisions that may be risky, but will ultimately uh, allow him to uh, uh, to um, grapple with with some of the um, abuse and and some of the exploitation that that happened to him earlier in his life. Okay, so can you talk a little bit about how Robert evolves throughout the book? There's a lot that happens to him. So just talk about his evolution as he searches into questions of his past and everything else that goes on within the novel. What happens is, you know, at the beginning, he's, he's uh, I think he's very cautious and he's afraid to uh, confront people who have power over him, who he feels can... Um, maybe um cause him to have to go back to the Philippines and lose out on the opportunities that he thinks he might be able to have in life uh he actually has a sexual relationship with a um a young woman his age and he uh has to make decisions about that and is he uh is he going to be able to commit himself to her or um is he or is he going to let go of that what what is he going to do? Is he um, is he going to basically try to protect himself and uh, abandon you know the chances to have that relationship uh, evolve and and become something important in his life, or is he uh, you know is he going to take some risks? And uh, you know at the beginning I think he's he's sort of cautious and afraid and and he also isn't sure what to do about. This close friend of his that um, was also involved with this young woman, and then over time, um, and this is you know when most of the book occurs, he uh, he gets um, I think inspired to to maybe uh, think about things differently and realize that he he can actually uh, take some risks. He can. Uh, uh, oppose some of the uh, the people who are trying to get him to uh, turn in the files, for example, and and let go of uh, all of this research, turn it in, and and not do anything about it. That he can actually uh, get together with his friends and, and create a um, sort of an oppositional uh, force that that stands up for him and, and his friends and, and what was done to them and um, and also uh, potentially reconnect with uh, this woman that he loved but was afraid to uh, afraid to commit to mm-hmm 
This isn't your first book. Your first book is called La Clinica. So can you please talk a little bit about that book? Yeah, La Clinica is, was a memoir. And uh, I think La Clinica in some ways led, led me to this book. But La Clinica was a story about uh, how I ended up uh, going into medicine. I actually worked in a little clinic called La Clinica before I started medical school as a volunteer. And La Clinic is about uh, my experience with the people of this little village, and uh, which didn't have any electricity, didn't have any doctors, and uh, so it, it starts off really telling the stories about uh, about the people and, and their lives, and, and a place that really uh, it doesn't exist in that way anymore. Now that that little village has electricity, and, and a lot of things are very different about it, uh, and and so talks about uh, how I learned uh, medicine and how I learned it before I even went to medical school and how that affected uh, my own priorities in my medical education and then my medical practice, how it led me uh, to work with populations that were underserved and um, go into emergency medicine. And um, it also confronts Issues around good and evil. The, the person who had uh, started this uh, clinic, La Clinica, had a lot of very good characteristics. Uh, was willing to devote his life to um, starting this little clinic and trying to provide resources to the people in the village, but also had some other very troubling aspects. Uh, and uh, so, how do you, you know, how do you make sense out of uh, someone like that who has um, some really remarkably positive characteristics and and also some very uh, troubling ones and and I realized that this person in many ways had become a mentor for me and and what do I you know how do I deal with that the fact that I, that he's influenced me in a uh, in a lot of positive ways as far as my career goes but uh, over time as I learn about some of these negative things uh, that he has done. I, I then have to kind of rethink what, um, you know, what that mentorship and what, um, you know, what that relationship uh, means to me. Uh, and it, it also, uh, a clinic happened, uh, or the, the, I was writing the book at a time in my own life where I was trying to relook at priorities and what I wanted to do and even my own relationships with my wife and um what was going to happen to our marriage. So there were things like that that I thought um, potentially were being affected by uh, how I had, uh, you know, the time and the commitments I was making to my career. And so how do I find the right balance in my own life between uh, kind of personal relationships and, uh, and commitment to patients and career and things like that. I am going to jump in here again so we can take our second break of the podcast. Before we do that, I want to talk to you a little bit more about Audible. I mentioned the free trial and that free book that you get. You can take those books when you can take your library with you and whenever you cancel and you can cancel any time. Those books are yours to keep regardless of if you cancel or when you cancel. Um, as I said, they have a huge selection. You get the one free one one title each month, and uh, two selections from Audible Originals, which have selections that you cannot find anywhere else. Again, are you thinking about doing more reading this year, or are you trying to tackle that huge to be read list that you never seem to quite get through? Audible can help you with that. Just go to www.audible.com slash GSMC book review or text GSMC book review, all one word, to 500 500 to start your library today. Again, it's audible.com slash GSMC book review or text GSMC book review to 500 500. Start your free trial, start your audiobook library, and start 2019 off with, um, adding to your list and and getting some some audiobooks in there. We are going to take a break and when we come back we'll be talking more about uh David's writing and what might be next for him, etc. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review podcast and we'll be right back. What happens to your decision making when you drink? Well, after one drink you feel confident. 
a few more, and calling your ex at 1 a.m. seems like a great idea. And you're pretty sure the secret to a great taco is four-day-old macaroni. The bottom line, drunk you doesn't make great decisions. So you're risking a DUI or worse if you count on him to get you home. Plan before you party. Get home safe. Brought to you by Washington Target Zero. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with author David Sklar. You mentioned that in addition to writing a memoir and a, a novel, you are also the editor-in-chief of Academic Medicine and that you write a lot for that. So talk a little bit about those three different types of writing that you do, how they, vary, how they differ, how they may be similar in some ways. Just talk a little bit about the various types of writing that you do. Oh, I think they're really, they're different in many ways. Um, to me, writing Atlas of Men was was fascinating because unlike when I'm writing um, nonfiction, I'm writing editorials or other kinds of nonfiction, in those situations, you're, you're pretty structured based upon what you know and what um, references you're, you're using. And um, so, so that kind of you're, where you're headed is is relatively clear, but with Atlas of Men, I I thought I knew where I was going. I I thought I had a general sense as to where I wanted the the novel to go. But once I started writing, I found myself sometimes going in other directions, and and there were certain aspects I, as I wrote the book that I realized um, if I wanted it to be successful, I I had to kind of delve into them in, in more uh, detail, some things that were somewhat painful to go in and, and talk about, that if, if I really wanted the story to um, to make sense, you know, that I had to go into some kind of dark places that I didn't really want to go into. Uh, and, and so it was, that was a very different process from uh, writing um, in nonfiction, where um, generally the at least the emotional and personal pieces are not quite as, um, I guess they're not quite as clear. Mm -hmm. I would imagine it's a very different process. So what's next for you? Are you planning another book? Are you working on another book? Well, I think um, right now I'm, I'm trying to get people to know about this one <laughs> and read it <laughs> and um, talk about it. And because I, I think there's a lot of issues uh, that, that I talk about, you know, some of them, Around identity and um, you know making sure that we give people the opportunity to to kind of feel that they can be who who they feel like they want to be and not that they're limited. So, uh, and I think that's a, a really important message for our time. But also, there's other issues around research and how we protect human subjects and the fact that, at least in this case, um, you know, human subjects, uh, those of us who were photographed, weren't protected in any way. And, and unfortunately, there's a history of human subjects not being protected adequately uh, in medical research. And, and so I think it, the book is important for us to read and think about in terms of the, some of those lessons that we can learn. But outside of that, um, I, I probably will uh, do more writing about healthcare in general and how we can create a healthcare system that I think will work for our country. Uh, I think we're, we're really struggling with that right now. So I think mm -hmm. I'll, I'll probably have some nonfiction writing on that. And, um, and then I actually, right now I'm, I'm working on some, uh, just some stories for my grandson, who's, who's just a year and a half. And I'm, I want to write some little kids books for him, but, uh, so we'll, we'll see where those go. But, um, oh, and fun. you know, maybe there'll be some more fiction. I don't know. A lot of it, uh, I have to kind of, I uh, feel like I've kind of done as much as I can for this book first before I uh, before I get going on, on something big. Probably write some short stories, too, because short stories are a little bit, you know, you can do those and you don't have to quite make the same commitment to a whole novel. 
Right. So it sounds like you've been writing in various formats throughout your career, maybe throughout your life. Is writing a novel or writing a memoir something that you've always wanted to do, or did you come to that decision later in life? You know, it's funny. I I I always love writing, and uh, I, uh, I I did do creative writing when I was uh, at uh, Stanford as an undergraduate, and and I loved uh, doing it. And uh, but I also really loved uh, uh, being involved with people and their lives in in medicine, and and I wanted you know I, I wanted to uh, be able to do something to improve people's lives. Uh, through um, you know, through being a doctor, and then I realized uh, in in my work as, as particularly as an emergency physician that that there were so many stories that came my way, uh, seeing what happens to people all of a sudden when when they encounter an emergency, when something changes in their life, and they go from just having a, a regular day to suddenly ending up in the emergency department, and maybe facing life or death and or or a major change in their life and who they're going to be that uh that that there were opportunities to combine both uh writing and and medicine so um i i hope i'll be able to continue to do both and uh i i think it's i've been very fortunate that uh, i've been able to have a career that allows me to um share stories with people uh, as as a doctor, and then write about stories, uh, hopefully to people in uh, in the literary world or in the reading and writing world, and and be able to uh, to be part of both of those worlds. Mm-hmm. And out of your unique perspective, then, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Well, one thing I will say is that uh, I never realized how hard it was going to be to write a novel. And I think a lot of us in medicine, I think we think, well, we've done all this work to be a doctor, and we know what that's like, and um, how to how to get the skills to be a whether it's a surgeon or an internist or whatever. And we think, well, okay, I've mastered that, and why why shouldn't I be able to write a book? But I, I would say that um, writing a book and writing a novel is a completely different skill set, and I have great respect for. Uh, people who are able to do that. Uh, it, it certainly took me a lot longer than I ever imagined it would. And I I think that if you do want to write and you're serious about it, you need to have a group of people around you who uh, uh, who will help you, who will give you feedback. And uh, at least for me, none of this came very easily. I you know, had many, many drafts before I got to something that I, I felt good about. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate. I have a uh, another physician writer friend named Frank Heiler. Frank and I have uh, shared each other's kind of writing careers. He was one of my residents in emergency medicine when I was a uh, uh, chair of the department. And I, I, uh, I've learned so much from him and watching his writing career evolve and his medical career and trying to combine it. And we give each other feedback on our writing, and, and I think that's that's really been helpful. But uh, it, it's very hard to do in an isolated way, and I, and I, as I say, I think you, you do need kind of a group of people, a community to kind of help uh, look at what you're doing and give you feedback. Because it, it's, I think it's very hard to do just by yourself to to know whether what you've done is good or, you know, needs, um, you know, has holes or whatever, uh, to to get it to the place where it um, is going to be understandable and make. Uh, make sense to others. Thank you for that. When you have time to read, do you have favorite authors or genres? Well, yeah, I do. You know, I uh, um, a recent book I I read actually was uh, The Sympathizer um, by um, by Nien, I think is his name, uh, and. Uh, Interestingly, his his main character um, was a Vietnamese um, fellow who, uh, as it turns out, was a spy uh, and had uh, also issues around identity of who he was. Was he uh, kind of a uh, loyal uh, South Vietnamese 
um, kind of uh, uh, supporter of the, uh, the regime there, or was he more um, supportive of the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong and so on? This was uh, so in the book. Uh, it's around the time when Vietnam is sort of falling uh, from the U.S. Uh, involvement, and and so I I found that that book. Uh, really resonated with me because the character in some ways reminded me of my character uh, in the book uh, and Alice and Robert Thames who also was uh, kind of trying to struggle with his identity of uh, where does he fit and who is he and, and what does it really mean uh, to be successful and um, and have a meaningful life. Uh, I think uh, other things that I've, I've read, I actually just... Uh, Read the uh, Saunders book uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, which still is uh, kind of uh, a, a book I think about because uh, it, it explores uh, death and what you know when when you think about death, what is what does that really mean in terms of the life that you led before you got to death uh, and kind of uncompleted uh, journeys, tasks, or uh, things that were potentially important for you, uh, and you know what what can we do as we look back on our lives uh, to think about the things that will be most important uh, in the time that we have. You know, because I think none of us know how long we have. And certainly, as an emergency physician, that, that resonates with me because I, I take care of people who are dying all the time, and I know that sometimes you know when I see them. Uh, you know they're um, in that place somewhere in between life and death, and it's not clear which way they're they're going to go and how much I can do to change that. And mm -hmm. uh, and so anyway, that particular book resonated with me because uh, I I just realized that um, it's a very uh, it's a it's a very strange place uh, you know as as people are in that um, in between state of having lived a life and potentially having that life end and uh you know what you know what do we think about during those times during those moments and if you do have a chance to come back how does that change you you know what w how are you different when you've actually come close to death so anyway yeah those are those are two books that uh, i i think most recently i've been reading thank you if people want to learn more about you or your writing or this new book, Atlas of Men, uh, tell them where they can find you. Do you have a website? I have a, I have a website, davidpscloud.com. And uh, so you can just go to that. And it does uh, it talks about Atlas of Men and also I think has some of my other writings. And um, you can Google me. And I, I have a lot of academic kind of writing that uh, if people are interested in the issue of medical education and um, some of the issues that we deal with in healthcare and health services, uh, there I have citations about that. But yeah, my my website uh, probably is uh, probably the best best place to to go. Perfect. Thank you for that information. We have talked about several subjects, um, and so I'm just wondering if there's anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to cover in terms of Atlas of Men or your writing or anything that we haven't touched on. Well, I yeah, I think uh, maybe the last thing I can I can say is that uh, I think it's really important um, as you know we look at the world around us right now and all of the uh, confusion about you know, about truth and about what's happening in the world and and uh, you know how we how we should uh, respond to that that those of us who write and who are good at it have our voices, um, you know, share our voices and our thoughts in, in ways that can influence some of the, the discourse around us. Uh, because I, I, I guess I really worry that, um, that a lot of the discourse is, is uh, led by uh, people on various news channels, television, you know, people tend to watch, you know, whether it be Fox News or whatever, and I think they get a very... Um, warped view of uh, of what's important and and how to think through problems and 
and how to understand them. And, and so I, I really feel like the writers among us have a, an opportunity and really, I think, a responsibility to try to help uh, our population understand you know, some of the threats that we're confronting and some of the potential uh, ways that we might be able to um, to um, to address them. You know, I also think you know we're we're losing a, a generation. My dad's generation; they're all the kind of dying off who got together um, around uh, World War II and and came together and learned a lot about each other and uh, and and had a kind of a common goal or a common enemy and and uh, and that that affected who they were for the rest of their lives and and I think now we're we're kind of an isolated uh, group of uh, different different people in in this country and I, I hope that the writers among us can can find you know help us find some of the commonality so that so that we we do come together around the things that we all believe in are important and that we you know we have a world for our children and our grandchildren to inherit because I, I do I do worry about that Thank you for that. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your weekend, the weekend before Christmas, to come and talk to me. Again, the book is Atlas of Men. I really appreciate you being my guest today. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you once again to Dr. David Sklar for taking the time to speak with me about his book, Atlas of Men, and his other writings. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, thank you to his dog for for joining in the podcast and uh, putting in his or her two cents there. You know, dogs want to have an opinion, too, and they like to to let their voice be known. Uh, Well, at least mine do. They are very uh, interrupting puppies. So (laughs) thank you so much to David Sklar for joining me. If you are interested in this book, you are in luck because I do have copies to give away. It's very easy to enter our giveaways. All you have to do is go to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram and comment on episode 131, Interview with David Sklar, and you will automatically be entered to win a copy of Atlas of Men. Again, that's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, episode 131, Interview with David Sklar. Just make a comment. It doesn't have to be anything deep or, for, deep or profound, just comment. A reminder also that the giveaways from last week are still going on for Of Another Time and Place and Learning to Love. Um, of Another Time and Place by Brad Schaefer and Learning to Love by Jennifer Wilk. You can still enter those. So again, go to our social media and comment on the appropriate posts and you will be entered to win. So three very different but equally interesting books that you you can enter to win right now from the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you are having a wonderful week. And if you are on vacation this week between Christmas and New Year's, wonderful. I hope that you can have time to go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.